gentlemen, the Committee on Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate will come to order. It's Wednesday, February 21st at 1238 p.m., give or take. We're in room 1150 of the Minnesota Senate Building. A quorum is present. Thank you very much for your patience as we sorted through some tech issues uh, so we can fully display all the things our testifiers want to present. We're going to start today, members, with Senate File 3607, presented by Senator Zhang. Senator Zhang, guests, welcome to the committee. Fire away. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, friends, and members uh, of the Energy Committee. Uh, thank you for th the time today. Um, I, th I would like to make a motion to uh, move uh, Senate File 3607 uh, for possible inclusion in the Omni uh, RDA bill. <laughs> Uh, with me today, I have Mr. Scott uh, Red, the president and CEO of Bethany Community Center, and uh, Janet Brown, the project consultant and development support for Bethany. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Scott Red, uh, who's going to walk through the project with us, all of us today. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Yeah. And members, just to be clear, it is the intention to lay this bill over today in the committee until we've heard all the renewable development account bills and we can make a decision together. Mr. Red, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair, friends, and committee members. Um, my name is Scott Red, and I'm President and CEO of Sabathony Community Center. Um, I appreciate your time today. Before we start, I want to thank Senator Zhang for his support. He's an incredible champion for environmental justice for communities across the state, so thank you. Um, Sabathney Community Center is a 58-year-old African-American founded nonprofit located in the heart of South Minneapolis. Our mission is to provide people of all ages and cultures with the essential resources that inspire them to improve their lives and to build a thriving community. As you see on the slide, Sabathony is a one-stop shop for integrated community service. We have a large food shelf, offer workforce training services and programming for youth and seniors. We, all, we, are, we are also home to 28 BIPOC organizations that operate out of our building, including the Monastery School and Goodwill Easter Seals. Each year, roughly 150,000 people come through those doors and of, these, of this 100-year-old building. And for you Prince fans, this is also the middle school that Prince went to, went to school at. So sometimes I hear him in the hallway singing. Maybe it's in my mind. <laughs> the goal is to establish, so our goal, um, four years ago, the city of Minneapolis and Excel selected Sabathony as one of three locations for a resiliency hub. The goal is to establish three hubs that can offer backup electricity in the event of weather emergencies or sustained power outages. Sabathony will be considered a non-wired power alternative or isolated from the larger grid and serve as a community energy center, emergency center. As we move to the fourth slide, our objectives when offering this project were to create a safe resilience hub to serve our 87% BIPOC community, reduce our emissions, create a living laboratory and workforce training, opportunities for families sustaining careers, and to reduce our energy costs. Slide five show some of the key actions we need to undergo to complete the project. Renovate our building for energy efficiency, upgrade with the HVAC geothermal system, install solar array, and a microgrid for continuous power. Provide a living laboratory and training center for geothermal and solar careers. We've already worked with folks and gave 300, helped 300 people find careers in, in South Minneapolis. We also want to expand to our upcoming multifamily housing and neighboring community with future phases. Um, slide six, as I, as I stated before, our building is nearly 100 years old, and it was incredible, and it is incredibly inefficient. When we started this project, we conducted an energy uh, we conducted an energy audit with CEE. Our Energy Star rating was a zero. Essentially, all the heat and air went right through our roof. We want to go from worst to first. We installed LED lighting, 90 smart thermostats, and a new roof and launched our solar energy efficiency workforce training program. 
we have done all the low-hanging fruit. The remaining piece is the geothermal system, which is why we're here today. Currently, Sabathne gets our heat from two giant gas-powered boilers, commonly known as Thelma and Louise. Our goal <laughs> is to push Thelma and Louise over the cliff, <laughs> who are near, they're nearly 60 years old, and they're on their last legs. Each year, we spend $20,000 in maintenance and pray that the boilers will survive another winter. By replacing the two gas boilers and 104 air conditioners with a direct outdoor air system, geothermal system, we will reduce our natural gas consumption by roughly 106,000 tons per year, or $61,000 a year. We will also cut our emissions by 1,100 metric tons per year. I will also quickly mention we are in the process of building a new 72 multi-family um, housing project on our campus. There will be enough heating and cooling capacity within this geothermal system to extend to the new housing unit and be likely beyond into the community. Lastly, we, can do this, we can't do this alone. We've got great partners, incredible partners. I want to thank all who have worked with us over the last couple years, has truly taken a village, and for that we are grateful. There's a lot more Janet and I can say about this project, but in the interest of time, we wanted to keep it brief. We, want to appreciate, your, we appreciate your time today and hope you will consider supporting our project this session. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Red. Members, let's save all our questions till all the testifiers come through, if that's okay with everybody. <clears throat> Not seeing any shaking of the head. Um, Ms. Brown, are you gonna testify? I'm just here to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair, taking, taking that as a, thank you, Taking that as a maybe. Um, <laughs> next on our list, we have Joe Demmel, Managing Director, um, Buildings from Fresh Energy. Mr. Dammel, please step forward. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yep, that's perfect. Nice to see you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Joe Dammel, and I'm the Managing Director of Buildings at Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based here in Minnesota. And for the past 30 years, we've been advocating for policies to achieve an equitable and carbon neutral economy. And we appreciate the opportunity to, to testify on Senate File 3607. Uh, as you just heard, Sabathony Community Center has been a pillar of South Minneapolis since 1966. Today, Sabathony provides essential services to over 150,000 residents in an 87% BIPOC community. Uh, and it, as you just heard, faced with an aging heating and cooling equipment and rising costs, the leaders at Sabathony have spent years planning and implementing its community energy project uh, that would renovate its HVAC system and also, importantly, serve as a testing ground and laboratory for technologies and workforce development. Uh, the project funds in this bill would support the installation of a district energy geothermal heat pump system and systems that rely on energy stored in the ground can be multiple times more efficient than the most efficient gas furnace or boiler or electric resistance heat, uh, especially in cold climates like Minnesota. Uh, in a similar way, investing in a project like the one at Sabathony would provide a multitude of benefits to the community that it has served for nearly 60 years. Uh, so for those reasons, we support Senate File 3607. I wanna thank uh, Vice Chair Zhang for bringing it forward and thank you for the time uh, today. Thanks very much, Mr. Dammel, for your testimony. Again, members, let's wait till all the testimony's in. Uh, next on our list is Nick Morton, Nick Martin, Director of Strategic Outreach and Advocacy from XL. Mr. Martin, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair, friends, members of the committee. Nick Martin with XL Energy. I uh, appreciate the chance to be here today and uh, convey Excel's, XL Energy support for Senate File 3607. Excel has been working closely with Sabathony since 2020. The core of our partnership is creating a resilience hub for the surrounding community. Sabathony has for decades been a center of gravity for, its, for, for uh, their neighborhood. Those 150,000 people that come through Sabathony's doors each year are Excel Energy customers. They're community members we care deeply about. And uh, many of them are also disproportionately vulnerable in an emergency due to decades of systemic inequities in wealth, health, home ownership, and other areas. 
So one part of our partnership focuses on creating a solar battery microgrid at Sabathany, one of three sites that are part of the Resilient Minneapolis project. This will enable Sabathany to serve as a safe gathering space if an emergency knocks out power. Sabathany would con continue to have power for critical services like heating, cooling, food, refrigeration of medicines, phone charging to stay in touch with loved ones. However, Sabathany has really helped us to think bigger. Their community energy vision is not only about what happens in an outage, which are thankfully quite rare. It's about strengthening the community economically, reducing emissions, helping people save money on energy, and connecting them to new career opportunities in the clean energy field. Those are also key goals for XL Energy. The centerpiece is to stabilize Sabathany's energy future by converting from ancient and costly to maintain natural gas boilers to a state-of-the-art geothermal heat pump system. That system will at first serve Sabathany itself, but later may be expanded, as Scott said, to, into a network system serving affordable housing on Sabathany's campus and even other buildings in the neighborhood. So it's an example of network geothermal and electrification of heating both of which are key components of our own plans as a company to achieve net zero emissions from natural gas use by 2050. The upfront investment is significant. It can't be funded entirely through existing programs. So if the legislature appropriates RDA funds to make the geothermal system possible, Excel Energy looks forward to continuing to support on the electric side via programs like the Resilient Minneapolis Project and our energy conservation and optimization uh, incentives while collaborating with Centerpoint to support on the gas side. So thank you for your consideration of this bill, and happy to answer questions when those come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, members, before we go to questions, are there any members of the public who wanted to testify on this bill but did not let the committee administrator know? Members of the public who want to testify to the bill? All right. Um, thanks very much to all the testifiers. Seeing no members of the public come forward, uh, we'll go to questions. First, I have Senator Matthews. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I first have um, a two-part question, I think, for you uh, and maybe to fiscal. I wanted to ask um, what you have in the RDA account. You partially answered this in your opening, but I was wondering if you could expand on the RDA topic a little bit. Uh, what do we have in the RDA account, and what is your plan this session for possible any RDA spending, what that's going to look like? Uh, Mr. Mueller, let me try that first. Um, thank you, Senator Matthews. So we have, um, you know, projection through MMB that up to about 18 million this coming year could be spent in RDA, and there was a suggestion of about another 28 million in the second year. The plan was to run an RDA bill as a standalone and to seek all the kind of um, projects to be heard first, then making decisions on how that money would be apportioned. Um, I'm always looking for geographic equity, so we've explained to everyone who's come forward an RDA proposal has to make sense with the whole RDA package, and I'm sure we're all open to ideas, um, including from you as the ranking member, about uh, timing or amounts per project. So um, that's the gist of it, Mr. Mueller. I see you looking at your sheet. Uh, anything you want to add to Senator Matthews' question? Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Matthews, the, the balance that I'm looking at at the end of, is about $19 million at the end of fiscal year 25 that is available according to the November forecast. Senator Matthews, is that uh, close enough? I had thought we would want to leave some of 2025 money, so I had pictured lower than 18 or 19. But again, members, that's the exact reason we come to committee to sort of debate it and compare it to all the different projects. Um, anything further, Senator Matthews? Members, questions to Senate File 3607, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the geothermal systems, but uh, I do have a few questions. The first one is to get right off the right out of the way. Uh, this this project would not uh, meet the requirements of the renewable development money, will it? I mean, is that why it says on the bill, notwithstanding the existing statutes? Senator Green, is that for Mr. Red? Senator it's John, actually for anybody. For I don't know if, if the if the author would know that or not. Maybe staff would know that. Uh, Mr. Mueller, you want to tackle that? Thank you, Senator Green. Mr. Mueller. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, there's often when we appropriate money from the RDA, we will put that 
in there. The, basically what that statute refers to right now, it's a pretty broad statute. It's either for research and development for renewable projects, um, grid modernization, and then the third clause is other innovative energy projects. Um, but we had, there have been a, a appropriations in the past, uh, last budget bill where they've put that clause in there. And basically with the, whatever the legislature appropriates it for, it can be used for. You don't necessarily have to have that statute in there, but it's sort of a, a catch-all to make sure that it isn't um, trying to go outside the intent of the original language. Thanks, Mr. Bueller. Senator Green, follow-up? <laughs> yeah, I got a few more questions, but it, uh, you know, I, I see this so much around here, and it's not that I, it's not that I have anything against this, this building and, and what they do. It's just that we have statutes in place for a reason, and yeah, they might be kind of broad, but uh, I've I've seen this notwithstanding in many bills, and, it, and I don't like it. It just drives me crazy. If you're if you're going to do these things, change the law. Don't don't try to get around the law, uh, because I was reading through the whole statute, and I don't think it qualifies. It just doesn't seem to to fit that. But uh, that's the one thing. Uh, the other thing is, ten million bucks is a lot of money for a geothermal system, and. And I'm wondering, first of all, um, if you've done the math on this, because uh, if you if you're saving sixty one thousand dollars a year, is that was no? That's my first question. Is that was am I correct on that? Correct. Uh, Senator yes. Zhang, Mr. Red. Correct. Uh, correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you, uh, not taking into account the fact that you're going to have to put in some kind of a system because yours is old, uh, that's like one hundred and sixty four years at ten million dollars. And that's not, you're not going to get a payback of 164 years on a, on a system. So that's, that's one issue. And so I'm wondering if there, if there was a study done on the size of this and the cost. Have you gotten estimates on this, or is this something that's uh, just kind of in the first stages? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator uh, Zhang. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Green, for that question. Um, Ms. Brown actually has a response. For that. Ms. Yes. Brown. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair Friends, um, Janet Brown, I'm project coordinator and, and um, development support. Yes, um, back in 2021, Sabathony completed a very comprehensive energy engineering study that was done with Center Point, I'm sorry, with um, Center for Energy and the Environment. With, um, it was, uh, took almost a year of looking at 12 different uh, HVAC systems that could possibly replace the boiler system. Many different factors were considered, and this was looked at as the most efficient system and also would meet many of the other goals that Sabathony has in being able to tie this into as a resilience hub, so not only reduce the greatest amount of um, reliance on natural gas, but also um, ongoing, the cost is very little to maintain and, um, and use a system. So that the number you had was just the gas reduction. It wasn't actually ongoing uh, reduction of um, facilities cost, so. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Senator Green. Thank you, but it was the savings, so that's what, what, we're, what we're going off of. Um, how big is the unit? How, how, what, what kind of tonnage is in this unit, do you know? Why don't we direct that to Ms. Brown? Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can answer specifically, because I don't remember the tonnage off the top of my head, but um, it uh, would be eight wells that would be drilled, and uh, that provides um, uh, both heating uh, for 188,000 square feet of the building and also excess cooling capacity by over double. So we would already have significant excess cooling. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And I, um, so and you answered another question, too. You're going to have a well system, and that was, that was my next question. You need usually you need some kind of pretty good open space to put these... Uh, these geothermals in the ground. And they are efficient, but yeah. they also, in most cases, require a backup. Because if the electricity fails, you're without heat altogether. Uh, do you have any kind of a backup uh, plan for this, or are you just going to hope that the electric grid hangs in there? Yes. Ms. Brown. Um, yeah, thank you. We do have a backup. I just want to answer the well question, too, because one of the great things about Sabathony, um, we did have a geological survey, and the, dr the drill... Um, the well drillers actually came and visited the site and said, this is the best urban location we've ever seen. 
um, because Sabathony is placed on almost five acres of land and where the senior housing is, it's um, a retention pond and so they could include all of the eight wells in that area. It's a, a perfect location for it. And yes, to answer your question um, regarding the backup system, uh, this project is also one of 25 projects of Center, with Centerpoint Energy. It's part of the Natural Gas Innovation Act and part of the funding that um, Centerpoint would provide a backup um, smaller, much smaller boiler um, on you know, if the system were ever to fail and also on the very coldest days that that could be used. Um, so, so there is also a plan to keep a small amount of gas um, uh, system in place. Thank you. Senator Green. Just a, co a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just, I can't get around uh, the fact that I don't think that this is really appropriate fund for this. And it does still seem like a lot of money for the amount of money that you're going to be saving. Um, and although the geothermals work very well, I have one and I'm very happy with it. But when you're, you're right about the fact that when it gets really cold, they don't always keep up. And, and if, you're, if you're sucking those wells too close together, what, that, what these systems do is if you're, if you're heating, they're taking the heat out of the ground. And then in the, in the summertime when you're cooling, then they're pulling the cold out of the ground. And if the wells are too close together or too big, they will malfunction. They won't work the way you think that they do. And it's a pretty big project for, uh, for this, so I don't think I can support it today. Uh, but I wish you luck. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Green. Members, other questions? Uh, again, it is the chair's intention to lay the bill over. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, thanks for the testimony. Um, what is the to maybe I missed it during your testimony, but what is the total cost of this project? Is it 10 million or are you contributing some money yourself? And by the way, I heard that uh, your nonprofit is one of the older nonprofits around here, and that you do do great work down in South Minneapolis. I want to thank you for that. But we're talking about this ten million. So, what is the total cost of the project? Thank uh, you, Senator. Thank um, you, Senator Zhang. You want that or Ms. Brown? Uh, thank you, Chair and, and uh, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, there, there are other contributions too, but uh, my testifier can go into more detail about sure. the different partners that are in this project. Mr. Red. Sure. So the total <clears throat> cost of the project is twenty-one million four hundred seventy-five thousand six hundred and twenty-two, and we've got um, we've got commitments and. Um, Potential funding includes this 4.5 million from investment tax credits, 6 million from EPA community uh, change grant, and we should know that by April or May. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response. You know, uh, Senator Green and I must be thinking on the same wavelength because I I divided the uh, 61,000 into the 10 million too, and now it's actually 21 million, uh, and at 10 million, you're at 163 years at a, even if you saved $100,000, you're at 100 years, <laughs> okay? So, you know, the ROI on this, I don't know if, if it's that great. Uh, in fact, it could be negative in, in my opinion. So, uh, personally, I think that, uh, and I'm not an expert, but mm -hmm. I think you might be better off going with natural gas. It's better for the environment, more dependable. And I think it'd be a lot cheaper than this. Uh, just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Members, any other questions? Um, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you very much for bringing this bill before us. If we were taking a vote today and not holding it over, I would enthusiastically vote yes in support of this project. And I just want to congratulate you for um, your vision and for all of the work that you have pulled together from various parts of the community to pursue a project that really does um, epitomize what we can do right now, the best of what we're able to do going into the future. Like we have to be done looking back and doing things the way that we used to do them. We all know that. So thank you for leading the way. And um, I just want to congratulate you on the project. Thank you for that, Senator McEwen. Um, and we're going to go to Senator Dibble right after um, we make the point that the project includes taking carbon out of the atmosphere. That's a goal of the committee. Also keep in mind the ability to uh, support the 72 units housing. So we have more going on than just the gas price, um, which is listed members at the savings that Senator Green and Senator Green mentioned with that. 
Senator Scott Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I used to be the big minder of the RDF myself, uh, so I think it's good to ask all of these questions, make sure we're uh, using it for the right purposes. Um, seems like we've gone far afield on a number of previous uh, appropriations out of the RDF since then. This, I think, is actually consistent with the goals and the aspirations of the purposes of, of when the RDF was first established for the reasons that you've cited as well as the, as the testifiers. And I just wanted to um, echo the enthusiastic support of my friend Senator McEwen. Uh, thank Senator Zhang for the bill. And just wanted to, you know, for those who haven't been to Sabathony, who don't know about Sabathony, what it is, how important it is, um, it is a very, very vibrant uh, center, a lot of activity is absolutely uh, a focal point of the community, not just the area right around uh, where Sabathony is for the entire city, particularly the south side. Um, I'm there all the time, have been going there for years, many community gatherings, many organizations that I'm attached to and uh, connected to um, have their offices there. Um, it's hard to over, I mean, I would just invite everyone just to go and just hang out there, you, you would be surprised at the, at the amount of activity that's going on all the time. People coming and going is a hub uh, of activity. Now there's a co-op right across the street, which is uh, really vibrant, um, and it's really, it's really a, a center of vitality, and this will help its success. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Dibble. Members, last uh, opportunity to ask questions before we lay the bill over. Senator Zhang, do you have any final comments before uh, we thank lay it you. over? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, community members, and I appreciate the questions. Um, you know, the RDA is a utility-funded program that supports investment in clean energy projects uh, in Minnesota, and I think when that was being uh, passed into law, they, they had projects like this in mind, and I think it's a great project uh, that will bring uh, social benefits but also economic benefits to Minnesota and for South Minneapolis. And I appreciate my testifiers taking their time uh, to be here. And I strongly encourage all of you uh, to take time to go visit the center too. Thank you. Big event Thank tomorrow night. Big event tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah. Big event tomorrow night. Thank you, Senator <laughs> Zhang. Thank you, testifiers. Members, again, it's the intention that we will hear all the RDA bills before we make any decisions. And with that, Senate File 3607 is laid over. Next, we're going to have Senator Matthews come forward with Senate File 3120. Senator Matthews. And members, uh, while Senator Matthews is getting set up, we had posted two other bills. Um, that we're going to not hear today. It, uh, Senator Matthews has my pledge to hear those bills in the next week or two, um, not just for scheduling purposes, but to try to keep the committee um, looking at as many bipartisan things as we can. Uh, with that, Senator Matthews, I understand uh, you have an A1 amendment. Um, Senator Matthews, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to revisit uh, this subject on studying uh, the possibility of advanced nuclear reactors. I do have an A1 amendment, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will move that amendment. I will note um, there, I've had some discussions uh, with Commerce, uh, some others that might want to talk as this goes along the way about adjusting the dollar amount and the timeline. Obviously, I'm assuming you don't have any any firm grasp on a budget number, targets, anything like that at this point. Um, so I am still going to move the A1 amendment as we have it, um, but I'm open to uh, if we need to have those numbers tweaked uh, as they go along uh, to adjust the time frame or adjust the uh, dollar amount as uh, this committee sees what we have to work with. I just wanted to put that on the record, um, but the, uh, the A1 amendment... Um, incorporates some language that we changed uh, in last year's version uh, at the request of Prairie Island um, to make sure that uh, waste uh, or spent fuel um, uh, was included in the study. And then we're updating um, the, the date in the bill because this was 
drafted last year. It had a 2024 date on it. We're just updating that to reflect 2025 and uh, might need to possibly modify it again uh, as this bill moves along. So with that, uh, urge support for the A1 amendment. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Senator Matthews offers the A1 amendment. Are there any questions from members to the A1 amendment? Uh, members, it's our intention to pass this out of committee today and send it to finance. So the A1 amendment available for questions. Um, seeing none, um, we'll take a voice vote. Uh, members all in support of the amendment A1 say aye. Aye. All opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Matthews to Senate file 3120 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate file 3120 as amended uh, will let the Department of Commerce study the use of advanced nuclear reactors and how it could help Minnesota achieve its energy policy goals and how to manage the spent nuclear fuel. Um, you've heard me talk about this um, multiple times in this committee uh, in the past years. Uh, I just wanna highlight some things that have changed as I think there is a resurgence federally uh, to be promoting and looking at nuclear technology. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the U.S. Senate just passed a pretty substantial package uh, that includes funding for uh, conventional and advanced reactor fuel processing. Uh, it's being looked at um, all around the country. Uh, I've got other comments that I could say to it, but I have a number of testifiers that I think have brought some uh, excellent discussion here today. So um, you've heard me talk on this several times. I will just allow uh, our testifiers to come up and share their thoughts on this bill as well. Thank you, Senator Matthews. With that, uh, members, we're gonna begin testimony again. Our intention to hear all the testimony before going to questions. For testifiers, we're hoping for testimony around two minutes. And with that, our first testifier is Isaac Orr, Policy Fellow, Center of the American Experiment. Mr. Orr. Mr. Emmerich will keep a little stopwatch going. Mr. Orr, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Sounds great. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Isaac Orr. I'm a Policy Fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American Experiment. And I'm here to testify here in favor of Senate file 3120, appropriating funds for the study of advanced nuclear reactors in Minnesota. Uh, my testimony is gonna be split into two parts, one talking about why we need new nuclear power plants in the state, and then a second part that kind of looks at what specifically should be included in the study. So nuclear is needed. Uh, blue states around the country are realizing that attempting to reduce emissions from the electricity sector, CO2 emissions, uh, without using nuclear power is a costly strategy that reduces the reliability of the electric grid, California, which suffered rolling blackouts in 2020 and has experienced many near misses since, has learned that firsthand that wind, solar, and battery storage are insufficient to keep the lights on, which is why Democrats have changed their mind on closing the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant in the state. Uh, this is a welcome nod to physics, which is the most fundamental of all the sciences and is representative of a broader shift in attitudes towards nuclear power throughout the country. Uh, for example, Illinois recently lifted its ban on new nuclear power plants, specifically allowing the construction of small modular reactors. Last session, Minnesota adopted its 100% carbon-free electricity mandate by 2040 without lifting the ban on new nuclear power plants, and I believe this is a grave mistake because our report on that legislation concluded it is far more expensive to reliably meet electricity demand relying on wind, solar, and battery storage than building new nuclear power plants. American Experiment believes Minnesota should be lifting its moratorium on all nuclear power plants. That includes small and large reactors. Uh, and we hope this study will help lawmakers and the general public understand the important role that nuclear power must play in our future energy portfolio to prevent rolling blackouts and provide affordable carbon-free power for all Minnesota families and businesses. And this is especially important. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation highlighted MISO, uh, our regional grid, as the region most at risk of rolling blackouts between 24 and 2028. So how am I doing on time? I thought I had three minutes instead of two. So, all right, three seconds over. With that, uh, written testimony will uh, cover what I think should be covered in the study. So thanks for the opportunity and happy to answer questions later. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Orr. Thanks for your attention to the time. These are just guidelines on time, not rules. Um, and of course, uh, Mr. Orr, stay available in case members have questions. With that, we'll go to Mr. Charles Sutton, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, and North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Mr. Sutton, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. I'm Charles Sutton, uh, members of the Energy Committee. Uh, Charles Sutton, on behalf of the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, and the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, I want to thank Senator Matthews uh, for bringing forward this important bill. Nuclear energy has, a pr has provided a form of safe, reliable, and carbon-free energy for Minnesotans for over 50 years. It has also provided good-paying construction and maintenance jobs for our members. With the new 100% by 2040 law, it is more important than ever that we are taking a hard look at advanced nuclear technologies that can provide carbon-free, reliable power when it is most needed and other sources aren't available. Advanced nuclear also has the potential to support decarbonization in support decarbonization in hard-to-abate sectors by providing industrial heat or producing clean hydrogen. As Minnesotans electrify, having a form of firm, reliable, carbon-free energy is going to be more needed than ever. Depending on the speed of deployment, our state could move from a summer peaking to a winter peaking state. This means we will need energy available to meet evening and winter loads when Minnesotans turn up their thermostats and plug in their electric vehicles. This will be a time when solar won't be available. Advanced nuclear is a resource we should be looking at to potentially address these needs and other power needs and complement wind and solar. Thank you again for hearing this important bill and for moving the conversation forward on nuclear energy. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Um, appreciate that testimony again. If you could stay around in case members have questions for you. With that, we're going to go to Brian Cook, Director of Energy and Elections Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Cook, welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. And just for context, Mr. Sutton's testimony was only 58 seconds. Just saying. Thanks, Chair Friends, members of the Energy Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee. My name is Brian Cook, and I'm the Director of Energy Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 3120, Senator Matthews' bill for a state study of advanced nuclear technologies. The Minnesota Chamber, which represents over 6,300 businesses with over 500,000 employees, believes in the triple goal of affordable, reliable, and cleaner energy. Energy costs are a business input that has generated attention and concern over the past several years as Minnesota's commercial and industrial electric rates have risen at a much faster rate than the national average. Nuclear power, comprising 24% of our energy mix, plays an important role in Minnesota's energy portfolio. As our state continues its transitions towards more renewable sources of energy, nuclear can play a key role as a source of carbon-free baseload power. We hear over and over again from Minnesota businesses that they depend on reliable, safe, and cost-effective power at competitive prices, which is why the Chamber supports allowing utilities to increase their use of this critical energy source. Without expanded nuclear generation in Minnesota, our grid's reliability will depend on storage technology that does not currently exist or on the continued use of carbon-based fuel sources. That's why other states, other countries, and even individual businesses in other places in the country are embracing the deployment of new nuclear generating facilities. If there is no appetite to advance a modification or full repeal of the existing nuclear moratorium this session, a study of advanced nuclear technology, like the one contained in Senate File 3120, would provide additional information to allow for legislative consideration uh, of those options in future legislative sessions. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Cook. I'm guessing you're going to get some questions on the racing to deploy part, so please stay close by. Um, with that, we have Jason Herbert, Vice President of External Affairs, Dairyland Power Cooperative. Mr. Herbert. Mr. Herbert, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Matthews, members of the committee. Uh, I am Jason Herbert. I am the Vice President of External Affairs for Darylin Power Cooperative, and I am here to testify in favor of Senate File 3120. This is an important and timely topic. Minnesota has joined many states in pursuing broad decarbonization. Yet, time and again, the prospect of rapid, large-scale deployment of new clean energy resources raises many uh, questions and presents many challenges. With only decades to transform, resource adequacy and optionality is paramount. Here today, the right question is being asked. What is the role and value of nuclear energy and a clean energy future? There is near unanimous consent spanning academia, think tanks, regional resource studies and integrated resource plans, and national and international studies that nuclear energy must play a vital role. 
For decades, nuclear energy has produced over half of the country's clean energy and more than half of Minnesota's clean power, including year-over-year 20% year, of all electricity generated in the United States from 93 plants and only 56 states, or 93 reactors and only 56 sites. And next-generation nuclear, like advanced reactors and small modular reactors, offer immense new promise, innovative modular technologies with enhanced safety, flexible, scalable, simplified designs, minimal land use, and the ability to quickly integrate with renewables and balance the grid. Every effort at comprehensive greenhouse gas emissions reduction has encountered the same fundamental challenge, how to maintain reliability while transitioning to a carbon-free system. Keeping the lights on requires dispatchable, always available generation. Coal and natural gas currently provide this service, ensuring, especially on the hottest and the coldest days of the year, that supply meets demand. Renewables and batteries play an important role, but there is no panacea. If coal and gas are to be curtailed, SMRs and advanced reactors must help fill the void by providing on-demand, carbon-free energy. The necessity of nuclear is evidenced by the Biden administration's recent announcement at COP28 that, to meet the nation's clean energy goals, the U.S. must triple its nuclear generation by 2050. Further, in recent years, numerous states have repealed or modified nuclear moratoriums, with recent repeals adopted in Illinois, Wisconsin, Connecticut, Montana, and West Virginia. Any clean energy transition will encounter innumerable challenges. However, if we utilize all the tools at our disposal, none are insurmountable. New nuclear technologies could, provide an could prove an invaluable tool, capable of not one, but many integral uses. While the scale of new clean energy investments and deployments should be fairly debated, new nuclear should not be neglected. The committee's willingness to consider a study evaluating advanced nuclear energy is encouraging and an important step. However, the state's bold clean energy aspirations will necessitate additional considerations, namely a repeal of the moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. Um, again, if you could stay nearby in case members have questions. Our final uh, listed testifier is Kayla Christensen, Executive Director, Minnesota Conservative Energy Forum. Ms. Christensen, please come forward. Welcome back to the committee. If you could introduce yourself and present your testimony. Yes, uh, Chair Friends and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Kayla Christensen, and I am Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservative Energy Forum, um, a nonprofit education and adv advocacy organization that promotes an all of the above energy strategy for Minnesota. We encourage policymakers to embrace innovations in energy based on our conservative principles, such as economic growth, property rights, personal stewardship, job growth, and national security. I'm writing to you today, or I'm, I'm here to, today to talk to you and share MNCEF support for Senator Matthews' bill, Senate File 3120, requiring a study of advanced nuclear energy technology and the potential benefits, costs, and impacts on Minnesota. While MNCEF supports the transition to more renewable sources of energy at a market pace, Minnesota will need additional sources to replace baseload energy currently generated by fossil fuels. We believe nuclear energy is a critical piece of the, all of the above strategy needed to stabilize, transform, and create a reliable grid for the future. It would provide reliable, carbon-free, high power output base load with a small land footprint. The study would look at the benefits, job costs, and impacts of nuclear power on the state of Minnesota and its grid makeup. Most importantly, it would equip future legislatures with the information necessary to make well-informed decisions regarding Minnesota's energy policy, policy to ensure a cleaner, more reliable grid and affordable energy for Minnesotans. We urge you to support Senate File 3120 and allow its important study to move forward. Thank you for your consideration, and we look forward to continuing the, to work to, towards a cleaner and more affordable, more reliable energy grid. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Before we go to members' questions, are there any members of the public who wanted to testify to the bill who did not get a chance to let the committee administrator know? If so, we have some time now. Seeing none, um, thank you, Senator Matthews. Thank you, testifiers. Members, we'll go to member questions. Member questions. Member questions. All right, I'm seeing no member questions. Um, Senator Matthews, anything to the bill? It, again, is our intention to move its passage to finance. Um, to your bill, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate the conversation uh, and your willingness to try to move this study forward. Um, hopefully uh, the timing is right uh, to try to get this done this year. Um, so um, I, I don't have uh, 
much else to add to what's been said. I think this is an important uh, tool that we need to have available in our toolbox. I think this study will be a uh, really good first step uh, in moving us towards that goal. So I'd urge the uh, committee to support the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Matthews. Senator McEwen. <coughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Matthews. I wanted to make a comment about the the bill. And when you asked for questions, I wasn't sure if I should comment then or if I should wait. No so. problem, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Senator Matthews, for bringing this bill, and I appreciate the the opportunity to have a conversation about this. Um, I guess um, I. I want to support this, and I, I do intend to support it today, but I, I need to make sure that I express that I have some misgivings about it. And primarily among those is that um, we're spending taxpayer dollars, our money that we pool together through our tax dollars, um, to study something that is um, extremely problematic in my view and in the view of many people around the world. So um, generally speaking, I, I want to support studies Having more information to make sound decisions about how we're going to move forward is usually a very good thing. And I hope that that will be the case with this study. And I trust that the people who will, who will work on it are going to be giving us some important good information to make decisions on going forward. Um, so I just learned also that um, this type of nuclear um, project is not going so well. I hear that a, a project that was set to begin operation in Idaho just collapsed. Um, so I'm a little, I, I am voting yes today, but I want just to, to people to approach this new idea with perhaps some skepticism as we move forward. And hopefully, again, this study will give us that information we need. So thanks again for bringing the bill forward. I'll be supporting it, with, but with some misgivings. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Senator Rarick, did you want to have a comment or question? Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate the comments um, from Senator McEwen. I, I get it. There's some trepidation uh, from some folks. Um, I would recommend, uh, Mr. Chair, um, whether it's through the LEC or even the, the two energy committees, you know, um, the nuclear laboratories in Idaho Falls have great information there in the process of studying a number of these technologies and this would be other information above and beyond what the study could bring to us that could help members uh, see how the technologies are emerging, how they're being tested uh, to be verify that they are safe and the ability to um, use some of the spent fuel that's out there because there's so much energy still available there. So these are other resources that would go great with this study to help us be able to make good informed decisions. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. And members, uh, the LEC had considered trips, um, you know, going to visit. Uh, Idaho is one of the places. And I do think we all agree on one thing, more information is better. So thank you for that, Senator Rarick. Senator Dibble, did you have a question? Saving up for a trip to Idaho. Um, saving up for a trip to Idaho. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Members, any last questions before we vote? Uh, again, the motion is to send it to finance. And I did want to point out that this will be the third time that the Senate Energy Committee had had bipartisan support for a study. We're saying we want to study this, and for our clean energy goals, it is, after all, carbon-free. And as we are having competition to reach our 100% clean energy, I think we're better off taking a closer look than refusing to take a closer look. So I'll be voting yes on the bill, Senator Matthews. Um, last chance for member comments. Um, with that, uh, Senator... Matthews moves that Senate file 3120 as amended uh, be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate Finance Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? The bill is passed as amended. It's off to finance. Thank you very much, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, the committee is adjourned until Wednesday, February 28th. We will not uh, plan on an omnibus energy bill this session. We will be passing single subject bills, and I encourage members over the next two weeks who have bills they think can meet um, the basic test that they could actually pass this year to bring those forward as we talk about them. With that, the Senate Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee is adjourned. <laughs>